Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Welcome to my edition of Mythbusters, ladies and gentlemen. Someone told me a long time ago that the crimes in the greatest ca crimes in Canada do not get investigated, and I didn't believe it at the time. They said that major economic crimes in Canada have less money spent on investigation for the entire country than this city in Lethbridge spends on its police force, and I didn't believe that. Canadians are very well versed in how much safer we are here in Canada, how our financial systems are the soundest in the world. Yes, but there's a flip side to that soundness, and I believe we should talk about it even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's Canada's best kept secret. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to show you how to commit the perfect crime. And I hope this projector will work for us and, and uh, keep going. Welcome to what the world looks like through my eyes. I am, I'm pretty sure that some of my information that I share with you today is, is quite accurate. It's taken me 30 years to gather it, and I provide some of the references. But I'm also sure that I'm confused and misguided on many of my interpretations. I, I don't have full peripheral vision, so I only see what I see, and this is the world through my eyes. Some of you might be able to see on my flashing image that uh, the world is upside down in that looking glass, where up is down, down is up, left is right, and etc. And I'd like to ask, what if wrong is right in certain instances, certain situations? And again, I really apologize for the flashing. What if some of the people that we see at the bottom of the economic food chain, uh, some of the hardest hit people in the country, are there are victims of their situations, and they're not simply just lazy. Um, what if some of the most respectable people in the country are actually taking advantage of us? And this photo that keeps coming up here is, is nobody you would know and nobody that even resides in Canada, so there's nothing, uh, nothing being revealed there. It's an indication of professionals, and my issue is with professionals who become predatory and take advantage of the people that they're supposed to represent. They, they corrupt the agency uh, avenues to take advantage of that relationship. So let's take a look behind the scenes, if we can, and see how to defraud billions of dollars, how to do the greatest robberies of all time, and do them with immunity from prosecution. This is how we do it in Canada. You doing okay, you think? I got that pretty snug and uh, tight, so. I think, I think it's a Mac issue. Yeah, okay, thank you. It's a Mac issue, ladies and gentlemen. We found the problem. I love them, but we'll just have to call this a multimedia lights flashing thing. Can you live with that? Uh, Morton's going to videotape this thing and we'll put it on the internet with a little bit more consistent uh, visuals so people can look at it. How to do the greatest robberies of all time, how to do them without prosecution. Uh, this is how the criminally rich get and stay rich while fooling most of the people most of the time. Let's start with a look at the list of the world's 10 largest bankruptcies to date. I'm sorry they're all American, but bear with me for a second. The ones in red were given multiple exemptions to the law. Exemptions to the law are when you want to violate the laws of the land to do or sell something that's illegal in my business, you go to the powers that be, in my case you go to the securities commissions, and they give you permission to violate the laws. So in a recent court case just prior to the holidays, New York Second <coughs> Circuit Judge Jed Rakoff referred to Citigroup, number five on this list, as a recidivist or a repeat offender which has violated the anti-fraud provisions of the nation's securities laws many times. Investors lost $700 million according to the SEC, while Citigroup gained about $160 million in profits. The next image coming up is Lehman Brothers Holdings Chairman Richard Fold. In 2007, Fold was paid a total of $22 million in bonus money while he was blowing up his very own firm. Apparently, and this is new to me in the last 10 years, apparently the new executive sport is taking as much money as you possibly can from the company that you manage by hook or by crook 
even if the company has to fail as a result of your actions. And we see that a great deal in the United States. You take your bonus and then you're gone. This was a $691 billion bankruptcy. Two exempt financings were given. General Motors, you remember those, those folks in 2009 had to go through receiverships. They had five exemptions to the law. Citigroup, November 2009, 80 billion, six exemptions, eight exempt financings. Enron, $65 billion bankruptcy. Chrysler Corporation, 39 billion, exemptions to the law. Now we're gonna look at a list of the top 10 admitted crimes in the United States since 2008, I believe. Um, Goldman Sachs wasn't on the list, but they were found by Senate hearings in the US to be selling defective investments, investments they referred to internally as crap, to their own clients, and at the same time placing bets that the products they sold would fail. So they were making money not only selling crap investments to their clients, but betting that the investments would fail. They had 16 exemption orders and 509 exempt financings. And oh, I have to apologize once again. The thing I forgot to tell you in this whole episode is that I forgot to mention that each of these companies that I've spoken about so far received permission from the Alberta Securities Commission to violate your Alberta securities laws. I'm sorry that I didn't mention that, but you might wish to ask your Alberta securities people why they are letting these firms exempt your laws and sell toxic products in your uh, province. So this is Citigroup again, 33 results under a search at the Alberta Securities Commission with exemption orders, etc. Judge Rakoff again stated that Citigroup realized in early 2007, and that date is key to the city of Lethbridge, they realized that the market for mortgage-backed securities was beginning to weaken. Citigroup created a billion dollar fund that allowed it to dump some dubious assets on misinformed investors. I think we know some of those misinformed investors. Later in 2007 was when the city of Lethbridge purchased their asset-backed commercial paper putting $30 million away. Uh, JP Morgan, I'll continue here with the lists. JP Morgan, nine results under exemption orders at the Alberta Commission, one exempt financing. <coughs> Merrill Lynch, 208 results, if you search their name, at the Securities Commission, Bank of America, 167. JP Morgan, 10 results. Wachovia, four. The top 10 crime settlements between banks and US law enforcement since 2008. There has yet to be any employee of any major Wall Street firm who has gone to jail. But protesters who have peacefully shouted against the criminality, or against the criminally rich, have been sent to jail for being belligerent. Did I mention at the outset something about how right is wrong and wrong is right in an upside down world? Ladies and gentlemen, you're living in a world today where it's right to steal billions of dollars from you and from your government, and it's wrong to speak about it. I find that confusing. I also find it confusing that there's 4,864 results if you search the word exemption or exemption orders at the Alberta Securities Commission. 4,864 times someone has gone to your provincial regulator and received permission or applied for permission to violate your laws. It's, it's exemptions like this would not be possible for food, for television sets, for automobiles, or toys. I think it's only for a certain class of society that special treatment is reserved in this legal manner. The criminally rich can buy and pay for each and every person needed to obtain special permissions. The only other time in history that I can recall such a magnificent capture of each and every person needed to pull off such crimes was with the tobacco industry of the 1960s. Some of you remember that. And we have them standing up swearing in Congress that nicotine is not uh, addictive and it was pretty much a lie, but they had enough money in that industry to buy every source of information on the planet and to, to uh, sell their spin. Today, I'm afraid it's financial servants 
who are at that elite class of being able to afford to purchase each and every message that's out there. They've turned into some of the world's greatest financial predators, greatest predators in general. The wealthiest people in the world today get to play games with our laws, your laws, and they get to damage nearly everyone by doing so, except they get to do it in secret. There's no one that gets to talk about this stuff. But wait, there's more. In my world of selling retail investments to retail mom and pop investors, people in this room, it was the elderly, female, alone, widowed who was the most preferred prey of the salesman predator. They were the ones that offended me the most. The criminally rich knew at the higher ends of, of my business, they knew that um, governments were an even better form of prey. And what if our government became the prey? It's never enough with the people at the very top. The higher levels of the investment industry, they knew that the easiest prey was a government. And the question is why? First, it's not their money, so they don't get quite as upset, upset when they lose millions of dollars. And when they lose the money, the first thing they do is they try to hide it because they don't want the public to be aware that they've just lost millions of dollars of public money. So they remain completely silent and they help in the abuse. They help in the process to continue. They hope that by the time the whole thing blows up, they'll be long gone and it won't be their problem, and they're usually correct. So at the city of Lethbridge, you know we put $30 million into an investment that wasn't qualified under our current investment policy and uh, wouldn't have been purchased by anyone with, with uh, any experience in the industry. The Alberta Treasury branches put 47 cents of every dollar that you have on deposit with them into these same investments. They effectively um, ruined the Alberta Treasury branch except that the government stepped in and provided refinancing and uh, restructuring with your tax dollars. And I don't imagine any of you were told that that had to be done. This information is found in the October 2008 report of the Auditor General of Alberta. Um, you can look that up. The executives at the Alberta Treasury Branch still managed to collect their executive compensation bonuses that year, despite losing about a billion dollars of taxpayer money, depositor money. University of Calgary lost over $50 million. So while I began my quest for ethics through dealing with retail investors like yourself, I'm finding today not millions of dollars of abuse, but billions. And I'm finding it a constant practice, a daily practice. I'm going to go through just a little bit of the numbers, and I'd like you to help me keep a mental note of them. Uh, Northern Telecom, our largest company in Canada at one time, is a $366 billion bankruptcy. The FBI and the SEC both say fraudulent accounting and bonus schemes brought the firm down. John Roth was one of the presidents. He took home a bonus of $120 million one year on fraudulent accounting. His, his bonus was based on the amount of sales in the company. So at one point in time, they took everything that was in all the warehouses in all the cities that Nortel had, warehouses, and they booked that under sales. They booked that as being sold using an accounting entry. Um, and presto, he made his bonus. The University of Toronto, Rotman School of Business, has a, a business professor, and they show that a study the abuse of retail mutual fund customers in Canada removes $25 billion a year from the pockets of all the people like the people in this room and puts them into the pockets of mutual fund dealers and sellers. That was one of my biggest beefs when I was in the industry is the double dipping and the additional charges and the selling of the highest commission paying investments. Uh, this study at the university is called, uh, it's titled a $25 billion pension haircut because professional investors like pension funds do not get abused like this at all. That's the smart money. Only you people, retail investors, pay this price. And you pay it in secret. You're not aware of it. And that's one of the abuses. New York's Columbia University did a study for the Canadian Finance Department when, when Finance Canada wanted to talk about a single securities regulator. They went to New York and hired a professor, John Coffey. 
and he found that the cost in Canada of having 13 different securities commissions in a Canadian economy, which is equivalent to the size of Texas economy, is costing us another $10 billion each and every year in burden. So we've got $25, in, $25 billion a year in pension a haircut in all your mutual fund abuses. And we've got $10 billion a year to keep the uh, investment regulators in business and the various handmaidens. And this is uh, a list of about 10%. If I blew the slide up to include everybody I can find in Canada who's on the payroll of the investment industry, it would take up a, a space, a, a screen bigger than this wall. The list gets up into the 120 range before I start to be grasping at straws. So all the crime in Canada is between 40 to $70 billion, depending on who's doing the measuring. This is Department of Justice. You can also go to Stats Canada, and they have a slightly different number. One's low, one's high. One's 40, one's closer to 70. In the United States, the FBI states that financial crime is equal to or greater than the cost of every other crime. And I have to say the same is true in Canada, just from the information that I have, and my vision isn't all encompassing. It's just by counting the cases I'm aware of. So to be specific, I don't research ordinary crime. I don't research crime in the streets. I leave the property crimes, mugging, theft, autos, vandalism, I leave that to the authorities. And they are doing that job to the best of their ability. I try to research and document crime done by trusted criminals. I find that area fascinating because it has a sociological or a psychological twist to it. It's crime in the streets, I'm sorry, suites, upper floors of office towers, rather than crime in the streets. Uh, I, I deal in this very narrow group of people or companies who promise professionalism and deliver abuse or malpractice, uh, who offer public, the public trust and hope and then they abuse this trust or destroy this hope. It results in two or more crimes each time. I began this back when I thought it was just investment brokers abusing clients' trust and money. And I put that on a website, uh, investoradvocates.ca, which is on the uh, business card out front. If you want to look at all the tricks of the trade, you can go there and learn what I like to tell people. Today I find that the regulators above the investment brokers, their participants, they're acting as handmaidens, kind of like the handmaidens to the tobacco industry in the previous century. And here's why I can say that. I began a few years ago by asking then Finance Minister Iris Evans three really simple questions about all of these thousands and thousands of exemptions going on around me. I asked her, what public interest is served? by letting large investment firms violate Alberta laws. And I asked her, if there is a public interest rationale, why are we not told about it? Why is it done in near secrecy? And the third question was, why is the public not even made aware when they're buying products that have benefited from a legal exemption? They're buying tainted goods. And her only answer to this was, it appears that the commissions carefully considered the situation and acted properly in granting the exemptions. I then took that question to uh, the Alberta Securities Commission themselves, and they say, and I have a copy of one of the exemptions here. This is Bank of Montreal, 2006 or seven, on some of those toxic investment papers. And they say, on all the exemptions, or most of them, that each of the decision makers is satisfied that the decision that meets the test for the decision makers to make the decision has been met. I was really, I was really, really happy with that answer. Let me tell you. I was so happy that the next finance minister, Ted Morton, had to run me off his land with a shotgun. No, it's not exactly like that. But I did ask him the same question, same three questions I asked Iris Evans, and his response and it's printed below in an email on a website titled albertafraud.com, was, I consider the matter to be closed and will not be responding to further correspondence on the subject. So I moved on to Ron Leipart after, you know, pulling my hair out for a year. 
And his response to billions of dollars of money missing from Albertans every year is, I consider this matter to be closed and will not be responding to further correspondence on this subject. Again, posted at albertafraud.com. I think we're going to have another finance minister in a week or two or three or whenever he retires. And I can just, I just look forward to the, the response that I'm going to get. Uh, on that note, there is a letter on the table outside to Premier Alison Redford that some of you, I would love some of you to send to her or perhaps people who don't normally print stuff like this, like the Calgary Herald or the Edmonton Journal. Uh, and uh, on that note, I'll say thank you to the Lethbridge Herald for being one of the better papers in Canada at printing things that are in indelicate at times. Yes. They're doing a far better job than any of the, the major business newspapers at telling you news instead of giving you publicity that brings them in revenue. So getting back to our memory test of how much financial damage those at the top can do in Canada to you, your family, your children. Uh, $25 billion a year on mutual fund abuses. That's the University of Toronto number. $10 billion a year on uh, 13 securities commissions. That's a Columbia University number. $35 billion was asset-backed commercial paper. That's a one-time hit. BREX, $8 billion. $20 billion. $20 billion on uh, income trust damages, Nortel 366, Hortus, Crocus, YBM, and a thousand others. Canadian Commercial Bank, a billion, Northland, quarter billion, Principal Group, half billion, Bramley, a billion, Confed Life, 10 billion, Livent, 500 million, Hollinger, 500 million, North Shield, 500 million. It adds up to about $35 billion a year as a base amount from which we start to build this structure of, of making the criminally rich richer. And then it adds about $500 billion in miscellaneous damages that you can average out over the last 10, 20 years, whichever, whichever time period you measure. And for me, it comes out to about $60 billion a year, give or take which is approximately what I come up with with the crime, street crime in Canada. Somewhere around $60 billion, 40 to 70 are the government numbers. So I'm just looking at an, a number for argument's sake, not to be extremely detailed, and for argument's sake, I say $60 billion on both sides of the fence. I could be out on that by huge numbers, but it's, uh, it's close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades. The uh, trusted financial crime on one side, so the, the, the criminals at the high end of the scale, the trusted criminals, the ones that, that you believe in, are doing as much economic damage even here in Canada than the people on the streets, than the violent crimes. And this is where it gets kind of interesting because I've taken this multimedia lights flashing presentation one step further and I brought Smarties. But these aren't just ordinary Smarties, these are military great smarties, so this jar right here represents $12 billion. And the reason I brought these smarties is because I was trying to imagine what $12 billion looks like. That happens to be the amount that we spend on policing in all of Canada, $12 billion. So here's my illustration of what $12 billion looks like, and we'll do a comparison of how much we spend on crime in the streets versus how much we spend on the criminally rich. Uh, there's the public report for, oh, I got this one. The other interesting crime figure, the Canadian Security Intelligence Agents, Agency, the spy agency, has a budget of 511 million, just to give you some perspective. 12 billion on all the police in Canada. 511 million on secret police. Any secret police in the audience? Show of hands. <laughs> oh, you guys are good. Oh. <laughs> You guys are amazing. That's $511 million that represents how much is spent on spying, spying on you and uh, other people, of course. And then we go to the city of Lethbridge. The budget for the Lethbridge City Police is $32 million, and I represent that thus with three Smarties spent in the city of Lethbridge. And then we get to major economic crimes. It falls under the RCMP Integrated Market Enforcement Team. They have a budget of $16 million for the entire country, and that is one and a quarter Smarties 
which I can't bite through a Smarty while I'm talking and give you the quarter, but trust me, there's a quarter of a Smarty owed to this jar that is how much, that represents how much we spend on catching trusted criminals in Canada compared to all the rest. I'm at 28 minutes, so I'd better move it along here. The proposed crime bill, Quebec studies estimated at $19 billion, the Harper government says 2.7, Kevin Page says phooey on the 2.7, you don't give us any numbers on that. Um, again, I'll, for sake of argument, I'll round it off and say it's gonna be somewhere in between those two numbers. So if it was $12 billion, it would be equal to all the money spent on crime in Canada today, which would mean unless the RCMP got a budget increase, this would be down to a half a smarty to spend to catch trusted criminals. Might be appropriate to join an Occupy protest someday. Do it for your children or your grandchildren, or at the very, very least, try to be open-minded and do not dismiss the social warnings that these people are giving they might be the canaries in the coal mine that we're all living in today. And I'm gonna jump past the asset back commercial paper thing and just say we had $35 billion worth of toxic subprime mortgage crap in Canada we had to dump. The banks went to uh, Ottawa, got $186 billion to help them out that way. They still had some pigs that they needed to dress up and sell to the public in their investment side. Uh, what do you do when you have an investment pig that you need to dress up and sell? You go to securities commission people whom you pay half million dollar salaries to do your bidding and you ask them permission to violate the law so that you can sell a pig and not have to tell people it's a pig. You can tell them it's a very attractive investment and you should own this. And that's exactly what, uh, what they did. The Alberta government's... Uh, a letter from Iris Evans, again posted on albertafraud.com, said that they gave 20 exemptions to legal firms to sell stuff that was toxic to you folks and to your governments. Investment dealers paid the regulator to get this permission and they didn't even understand what they were selling. But that's not the game for the criminally rich. The game is not to understand what you're selling. The game is to get rid of junk and give it to someone else. And the city of Lethbridge is a beneficiary of that. Even in the uh, Lethbridge Community Foundation, we, we have professionally managed money for $15 million of charitable funds. They have it managed in Vancouver and they use pro portfolio managers. I'm told in Lethbridge we don't need to do that with $150 million of taxpayer money that we can do a pretty good job on our own. And as you can see, that's not worked really well. This woman uh, was just one of a few suicides related to this uh, investment scheme. And when the complaint, and I'll wrap up really quickly here, I see you nodding at me, I'm getting down to the point. When a final complaint is made to the RCMP of a criminal nature, and at the same time they receive a complaint saying that there's a possible breach of trust by these securities commissions, that the securities commissions are actually helping to allow the crime, what does the RCMP do? They bring in the help of Securities Commission employees who sit on joint management committees with the RCMP to help them to close this file and write up a very apologistic looking report as to why there's no crime. So if you'd like to commit the perfect crime in Canada, be a trusted criminal, be part of the criminally rich because the police do not look there even if you tell them to look there. They haven't got the time. They haven't got the budget. They do one case a year, one case at a time in every IMET office. There's 90,000 frauds a year in Canada. So if you have a fraud against you, they're gonna take a number and they're gonna deal with you in the 22nd century. Anyhow, summing up, what if people like this could do more economic damage than every other crime in the country? Politicians, regulators, lawyers, bankers, they're in meetings today, right now, as we speak hundreds and hundreds of them across Canada, plotting and scheming how to divide up the public pie amongst themselves, how to sell out your interests at this moment, how to cut the laws, how to skirt the laws, how to cut regulations, and this is happening in Canada. And your public servants are sitting in on those meetings. The next time you hear the words the RCMP is investigating, I'd like you to remember how much they have to investigate with. But in the budget, to, to, be a, to be fair with the RCMP, the budget that I pulled this from was 2009. I think they're gonna get 30 million next year. 
And in that 2009 budget, they did get $38,000 to buy a new automobile. So they do have a new car in the RCMP. It's a couple years old now, but it's probably still good. Uh, this sign might be the most accurate sign. This is not a recession, ladies and gentlemen. This is a robbery. If you don't believe it, look at the headlines in the U.S. and follow what the media is saying in the U.S. and the rest of the world. It is not a recession. It is a robbery. You are the victims. The violence of white-collar crime is what it does to every single one of us a little bit at a time. And final slide. Thank you for taking the time to view the world through my eyes. I could be correct on a few of the things, and I'm sure I'm misguided on many. But this is what I see, and this is my story. Thank you. Thank you.